Good day to you, wherever you join us in the world today. Uh, you're watching the latest in our series of expert panels at the Logistic Business Virtual Show. My name is Paul Hamblin. I'm editor of Logistics Business Magazine. And the theme for this latest panel is around the workhorse of the warehouse, the forklift, and yeah. something without which no reputable warehouse can really do without. And I'm joined by a true global panel today because we've got panel we've got panelists from four continents from from North America from Africa from Australia and from good old UK as well so I'm delighted to welcome them and I'll ask them to introduce themselves in a second uh, but please do use the chat facility within the platform to send questions to our panel and they will do their best to answer those for you. So uh, don't be shy and please do do that. Um, so without further ado, let me ask everyone in the panel just to introduce themselves and then we'll kick off. So sh should we start with you, Pete? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so my name is Pete Wooding. I work for Crown Lift Trucks Limited um, and have done for the last 28 years. Um, my, my role today is Manager of Technology and v &A for the UK, um, mainly from a sales perspective. So, you know, for any kind of new technology that we're, we're trying to push out there, um, that's, that's my role to get that out into the marketplace. Thank you, Pete. And now we go over to Australia, Louise. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Louise Inglesia, I'm the CEO of Genie Grips. We're an Australian manufacturer of forklift safety products. We've been in the industry for 10 years and we've developed five products over that time. And we basically export them all the, way, all the way around the world to help keep the world safe. Thanks, Louise. And now across to what looks like an enviably sunny Cape Town, Adam. <laughs> yes, hi, Paul. Yeah, so my name is Adam uh, Duda Smith. I work for Marangoni Industrial Tyres. Uh, I've done so for, for the last uh, nine years directly. Um, we have the head office, the commercial division in Italy, and then two factories in Sri Lanka that produce the product. Thanks, Adam. And finally, across to, to Canada and, and JF. Hi, thank you, Paul, for, for having me. And uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so my name is uh, Jean-Francois, but yeah, you can use JF uh, for, for, for today. Uh, I'm from uh, Canada, but Quebec uh, specifically. So that's why the, the French speaking. Uh, I represent Hugo Work. So I'm direct, uh, marketing director for, for Hugo Work. We are a uh, lithium ion battery provider. And uh, we also have a um, energy as a service uh, package that I will uh, discuss later. Fantastic. Right. So what we'll do is I think we'll we'll start by asking each of our panels to talk panelists to talk about their products and, uh, and innovation. And then we'll get into maybe some of the wider issues that they that they face and that forklift users face as well. So perhaps the obvious place to start is with a truck itself. Uh, and no finer representative of, of the forklift than Crown Lift Trucks. Pete, what are the what are the what are the new products and the breadth of products that, that are coming from Crown at the moment? Yeah, so I've got I've got about half a dozen that I'm gonna I'm gonna run through over the next few minutes with you. Um, so first off um, would be Crown's Infolink fleet and operator management system. So today. Um, one of the biggest things that we're seeing is the effective use of data being key to efficient fleet management. Um, so over the years, we've developed our uh, fleet and operator management system known as Infolink. We've recently developed a seven inch touch display module. So a you know, seven inch screen, which is interactive, has a touch display on it, rather robust, seeing as it needs to be given the, um, given the industry that we're, that we're working in today. Um, so this gives the operators here an intuitive use, user interface that helps to facilitate what we term as operator onboarding. So what we mean by onboarding, from an operator perspective, um, it, gone are the days where operators just simply move a pallet from A to B. There's a lot, there's a lot of other things that go on in that warehouse, you know, the do's and don'ts of operating fork trucks. So using our um, Inflink Fleet and Operator Management System, we have a uh, a function or a product known as dynamic coaching on there, which allows us to um, not only tell the operator when they're not complying with certain aspects of things, but also to tell them when they are doing. So both positive and negative feedback for the operator. 
Um, there's a lot of other things that we have on there, given the fact that we have a, uh, a touch screen on there. Um, it's rather interactive. We have widgets that the operator can set up and program themselves to help and aid throughout their, their normal working day. Basic things that are you know, mandatory from a fork truck um, perspective, things like operational pre-shift checks at the beginning of each shift. Um, traditionally, they're done through a paper checklist. So using our, um, our Inflink system, they're all done via the, the module that, that's on the, on the truck itself. Now, again, given the fact that today we're using a, a seven inch touchscreen, these become um, rather more prominent in the fact that we can make them pictorial. So not only are we asking operators to check this, that and the other, but we're physically showing them the areas of the machine that they need to check. So it makes that whole process a lot more, a lot more interactive. Um, second thing is our uh, ESR 1000 series reach truck. So our, our ESR has a, um, has a feature known as, um, as known as Express Lower on it, um, which does a number of things. First and foremost, it's capable of doubling the truck's lowering speed up to a, um, a speed of 1.1 meters per second, um, which is pretty unique in the marketplace today. So this allows us to increase productivity for the likes of letdowns and putaways um, up to about 21%. We also have um, your regen lowering function. So whenever we lower the mast, we're also recuperating that energy um, and utilizing that throughout the truck. Um, <clears throat> the ESR also runs on our latest Jenna operating system. So our generator operating system um, has built in connectivity that allows us to provide operators, managers, service engineers, um, with a connected data rich environment that's more what we term as human centric, a um, bit more personalized, a bit more interactive, um, has the option to have Inflink built into it. And part of that Jenna system also includes a seven inch touchscreen built into the truck. So, you know, why wouldn't we include our, our seven inch fleet management system into that? So needless to say, all the functionality that, we, that I've just mentioned to do with Inflink is also included, should the option of Inflink be taken on the ESR 1000 as well. Um, so we'll then move on to our TSP series of very, very narrow aisle trucks. So TSP stands for turret stock picker. So this is a, a machine not only for moving parts, but also for, um, for achieving stock picking as well. Um, exceptional travel speeds, capacity and height on our current, uh, current VNA, the TSP. Um, we have an industry leading mast design on there that we term as the mono mast. So unlike a conventional ladder style mast, this is a complete box section mast. So you can imagine um, the likes of tower cranes, um, boom cranes, which use a complete enclosed box section. It adds an awful lot of rigidity and stability to the machine as well. One of the other things that we have on the, uh, um, the TSP range is our move seat. So traditional seat in the truck is, is sort of forward facing or facing the forks. Our move seat is situated where you can pivot the seat to certain angles. So from an in aisle perspective, you can pivot this to a 90 degree angle, which allows exceptional visibility in both directions up and down the aisle, leaves very, very few blind spots. Um, which obviously from, from an operator perspective is key to what they're doing on a, on a VNA machine. Um, so we then move on again, sticking with the TSP series to um, Crown's auto positioning system. So this is a form of semi-automation on the, the VNA machines on, our, on Crown's TSP, which in a nutshell enables us to take the truck via its most efficient and effective route from an A to B location within an aisle so effectively from one, one pallet movement to the next pallet movement or, or one pick to the next pick location. So rather than, you know, potentially an operator traveling across the bottom of the aisle because that's the fastest point for the truck. And then at the last minute, um, raising the truck to the, um, to the point that they, they need to pick the pallet or, or to, make the, um, to make the pick, um, the truck will actually use its most efficient and its most effective route to get from A to B making the most of its travel speeds and its, its lift at the same time. So we can see increases in productivity by up to 25% by using our um, APS or auto positioning system on that. 
Um, the next thing, again, sticking with, with the TSP series, is Crown's auto fence system. Um, so auto fence basically aid, helps us to aid safe operation. Um, we can automatically re restrict travel and or lift height in certain places down the aisle, all based on the location of the truck. So, for example, you know, you might have a, um, a safety escape aisle coming through the middle of a large aisle. Either side of that aisle, we can slow or potentially stop the truck um, to prevent the truck from going straight across the aisle without the operator being able to look in either direction. Um, likewise, for any height restrictions, we can automatically limit the lift of the truck. So it will prevent the operator from, um, from coming in contact with any of those overhead restrictions. Um, we can also bring, you know, bring the truck to complete stop at the end of an aisle um, as part of our end aisle control system. Okay, Pete, I'm gonna, that, that, you're giving us a great intro there, some great things there. I'm going to come back to those later on, if I may, because you've touched on some important um, general points. What I want to do is bring everybody else in now, and I'll come back if I may. Yeah, sure. Obviously, Absolutely. the, the, the forklift can't work with it, without, without wheels, and it can't work without um, motive power plants as well. So let me come to you next, JF. Tell, tell me what's, what's new in your world in, with this. I'm sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, yeah no um, So yeah, like like you said, the battery uh, powers the forklift. So that's a quite an uh, important component of the of, of the whole. Uh, what we did is uh, rethink uh, how the battery uh, works and uh, operates with the forklift. Um, lithium ion is uh, in the beginning. Uh, depending on the sources, you might see five to 10% adoption in the market uh, from, from the different reports. So we're still in, in the early adoption phases of, uh, of lithium. Um, what, we, what we have is of course a, uh, a lithium ion solution, which has um, all the benefits of the, the chemistry itself. So for those who are not familiar, uh, it's a faster charging. Um, it's, uh, it's also, uh, uh, more efficient, so less electricity to do the, the same the same work. Um, it's also uh, less maintenance. You basically don't have to swap batteries if you have a very intense application, and you would normally swap batteries with uh, with lead acid. So all of those come with uh, with lithium. Um, all providers basically uh, get those benefits um, to the customers. What we have uh, different at UgoWork is uh, a charging infrastructure that is, that is very different. Uh, typically, you would have a charger on the wall, and uh, the battery has to fit the, the charger. Uh, so for, let's say, a reach truck, uh, 36 volts would have to match uh, the charger, uh, which would be a 36 volt. What we have is a uh, embedded charger in the battery, which means that we have universal charging stations. So basically sockets in the wall that any, any truck can go charge to. So it brings a lot of flexibility uh, in the layout of, uh, of, uh, of the warehouses. So this is something uh, that we are very proud of. And another thing that we have at Hugo Work is a unique uh, automotive charging gun to, to charge the battery. So for those who are, are not familiar, um, typically you would, you would use a SB uh, type connector to uh, disconnect the battery and connect it to the, to the charger. In our case, the battery remains uh, connected with the SB in the truck at all time. And you, you just have that uh, automotive grade connector that, that uh, charges the battery. Um, also, there's another, uh, very uh, relevant aspect to, to, to lithium and to battery right now, it's uh, recycling. So EV is going all the way into, uh, into lithium and it's a big issue. What, what are we gonna do with, uh, with all, all that lithium once the, the end of life arrives? So we have a design that allows us to easily remove uh, the lithium pack, actually swap a pack at the end of life because the end of life of the lithium will typically come 
before uh, the end of life of, of the battery itself, which is steel and electronics. So our, our customers typically would uh, uh, benefit from a refill of the lithium pack when, when it's required. And uh, then that architecture allows us to have a much uh, smaller carbon footprint uh, over the whole uh, life of the product. Uh, and then it's still uh, in, in its infancy, but there, there are now providers of uh, recycling, uh, lithium recycling uh, processes. So we partner with, uh, with some of them who are here in, uh, in Canada. And just to, to name one, uh, we partner with uh, Lithium Recycling. And uh, these guys developed a process that allows to uh, recuperate 95% uh, of the, the lithium uh, from, from cells and uh, produce battery grade lithium that can be uh, sent to a, a cell maker. So this is very interesting in terms of uh, sustainability. Um, so that's JF. Is it essential, JF, to develop this recycling facility with lithium because it's so hard to dispose of? Oh yeah, that's. Uh, I think that's that's the future. Uh, the 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 word that they use is uh, urban mining. So you know, there's a lot of lithium already out there in your phones, in your computers, and in, in uh, EVs, of course, in uh, in forklift batteries too. So. Um, that, that resource is not unlimited. So we have to definitely go that route to, to make uh, that source of energy sustainable in the future. Right. So, and and that, that guided the design of the product, the Ugo Work product. Okay, we'll come back to, have you got any more you wanted to add in terms of innovation, Britt, or I'll move on? Yeah, well, I, maybe I just want to touch uh, data. Pete, uh, Pete mentioned that data is important. Uh, all our products are uh, clouded, so meaning that uh, every second there's a, a packet of information sending temperature, uh, kilowatt, tension, and all the, the signals of the battery, the, the vital signals of the battery to a cloud. And then we have algorithms analyzing that data. And uh, this is where we're able to take um, uh, proactive actions for maintenance uh and uh, the security of the product but also to improve operations and finally the the last one uh, I'll, I'll be quick on that um lithium is more expensive than than lead typically four times more expensive at, at the at the price point at the purchase point uh, but over the the life of the product the total cost of ownership will be will be small if you have an intense application because you save on maintenance, you save on labor and all of those things. But the initial expenditure is quite difficult uh, because like I said, it's four times more expensive. So that's why we have a we have paper use plans. Uh, basically, we um, we offer the battery as a service so energy as a service and um, customers can benefit from the technology without taking the risk uh, and we, we take care of everything. So, Thank you, JF. Um, as I said, wheels, wheels are also pretty important on a forklift and especially the tires. So Adam, talk, tell us a bit about what, what Marangoni is working on in, in terms of tire innovation for forklift. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, um, well, with the introduction of, a, of our new factory facility in Sri Lanka uh, to the beginning of last year, uh, has has sort of enabled us. It's given us much more 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 capacity, obviously, to produce product, but also it's enabled us to expand our product ranges um, and and create new ones. So, notably, we were we were really missing a a press on ban for the U.S. market with a more aggressive tread pattern. Um, so so that's something that we've now developed and focused on, which is our new cushion Forza product. Um, we've also uh, launched a, a solid skid steer product. Um, other other brands have have similar, um, and we were missing that product. So that's been excellent to bring that into our our range. Um, then there's a, a, a new excavator product as well, a solid tire that we've launched, uh, which has been quite successful. More of a budget type tire, which Marangoni aren't really known for, um, but there was definitely a gap in the market there that we wanted to be involved with. Um, and then there's our Evo range, which which we we launched, I'd say two years ago now, maybe, well, no, more like three years, really. 
time flies uh, but the the evo product is our is our product that's that's mostly used on on battery forklifts um because of the it was developed with a with an oem um electric oem supplier and manufacturer in europe and we it had to be incredibly low rolling resistant product so that the the battery on or the battery on the on the forklift would last as long as possible but then obviously if whatever the fuel is, if it's low rolling resistant compound, then then that fuel is going to last longer. So so we've grown that range extensively with within the Eltor Evo um, to 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 encapsulate any any forklift truck for any application um, and any size really to make sure that that's fully available. Um, and then. Yeah, I mean, so really, it's just been the growth of, of that through that factory and the, and the building of the product ranges that we've really focused on and and new products that we've launched, which I've mentioned. Um, and then just increasing stocks in and around Europe, you know, with with the way that logistics has been over the last two years, really, we've 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 really been sort of using that factory to just get stocks out in as, you know well in advance to make sure we've got availability for our customers and, and that they don't get holdups from their side so so yeah that's been essential thanks adam and then finally louise thanks for your patience um we're waiting you know in a large panel like this but please tell us now about about gd grips well, Genie Grips are forklift safety products. So if we, we touch a bit on the statistics around the world, so 1,300 UK employees are hospitalised each year with serious injuries following forklift accidents, and nearly 18% of fatalities in the transport and store, uh, storage industry um, for Eurostat. And then in Australia, it's nearly $120,000 is the average cost of a workplace injury. And 15 billion annually uh, US dollars is the amount that they say is wasted by damaged product from forklifts, um, lost, lost product. So we understand the importance of forklift safety in the workplace, and that's why we developed our products. So our main, our five main products are a rubber bonded product that sit on the fork tines. So we have our mats that completely enclose the fork tines to protect anybody a uh, product from slipping or product getting damaged. Then we've got our Genie Grips caps that sit on the tip of the tine. And these are a little cap to stop product getting damaged um, as they hit when they're getting loaded and unloaded. Then we have a magnetic cushion that sits on the upright that stops product from getting damaged once the forklift has gone in. And lastly, in our rubber products, we have our sticker pad, which is a new low profile that sits inside the footprint of the fork tine. And that um, that's a removable stick it on, stick it off, almost a throwaway product. And then as Pete mentioned before, we um, the visibility of the drivers when they're driving, we've got our loading mirrors, which is has a parabolic mirror that reflects what's happening in front of the fork onto a mirror for the driver to be able to see the tip of the tines when they're loading and unloading the forks. So we really, we really are conscious about reducing the risk in the warehouse um, for any forklift in any industry. So we cross all sorts of industries from especially chemical, when you're carrying IBCs, um, products, damaged product, finished product, galvanized, powder coated, all those sort of ones that want to protect the product once it's been manufactured because it's really costly to do redos. Um, and so we focused on making sure that we can make this forklift as safe as it, it can possibly be, not only for the people in the warehouse, but also for the driver, product tipping over, product slipping and all of that. So yeah, that's basically what we do. We've been doing it for 10 years and we've got warehouses in the US Netherlands and the UK now. So we export all the way around the world. Thank you very much, Louise. Um, yeah, coming back to you, Pete, um, what, what, what struck me um, about, about so, so much of the innovation that you were talking about is that it was geared towards um, visibility in the sense, visibility for the driver, but also visibility in terms of data visibility in terms of being able to see what the what the forklift is doing in terms of its usage um, and in terms of the data that it can provide 
Um, and you, you, you know, you mentioned the auto positioning, the routing, how that's a potential ergonomic, uh, sorry, efficiency saver. I mean, are those the questions that your customers are asking you now in terms of what they want from a forklift? That's a long way, long way around of coming to the question, I suppose. What are the questions that customers ask you most often? What do you need to solve for them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that, you know, that Crown is, um, is very prominent in is the communication and the relationship that we've got with our customers. It isn't just about selling a truck. You know, gone are the days where, you know, a counterbalance truck is just the counterbalance truck. There's a lot goes into that. You know, it's, it's about the whole application. It's about the end-to-end -end movement of those products through, throughout the building. And, of course, there's a lot of data that sits behind that, not just from a, um, you know, an operational perspective for the customer itself, but literally from a truck perspective, there's a lot of regulations surrounding the operation of trucks. And anything that we can do to make that less painful for the end user, you know, one of the examples I gave earlier on surrounding pre-operational checks, it's it's a simple thing, but uh, traditionally pre-operational checks are done on a paper checklist, which has to be collated and filed. And then if they ever need one of those checklists, somebody has to go and route that out again. Well, of course, if they're, they're all done electronically, there's no paper to lose or get dirty or get lost. Um, and they're also filed electronically. So at any point of any time, it makes that data easy to retrieve and easy to get hold of. And that goes right throughout what we do within, within Crown's range of, of trucks. Right, and the, I suppose another issue that came up, and this also ties in with Louise's product, which of course is totally safety related. Um, are, are we perhaps heading to a world in which forklift drivers may not have to be quite as skilled as they had to be in the past? Or is that a, is that a disgraceful thing to suggest? I, I suppose that's for you first as well, Pete, there. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, if I can just very quickly, um, you know, give you an answer from our perspective on that. Um, to a large degree, yes, what you're saying is correct. You know, it's something that we are seeing today is, is a lack of skill set coming through. And that's not just with operators, um, but specifically from an operator perspective. Our, I mean, our auto positioning system is geared at exactly that. It's one of what we term the soft benefits that the system gives us. Simple things like because, because the system itself is providing that A to B movement, the operator is almost the passenger at this point. Um, what we're seeing, and you know, we've we've had um, you know we've had customer feedback that you know that gives us this data. What we're seeing is simple things like a novice operator becoming an expert in two to three weeks because of the use of those kind of systems, whereas ordinarily that might be a you know, three month bedding time before they can start hitting KPIs. So it's very quickly bringing those, you know, those expert operators down to a, you know, a two, three week lead time for them to hit the productivity that's being expected of them these days. Right. And, and Pete, if, if I may, uh, well, uh, how, how does Crown um, position uh, about AGVs in uh, auto? automated uh, guided vehicles at this point? Is, do you foresee that as, as being the future or partly the future? So, yeah, that's kind of a movable feast. Um, you know, there's a lot of people looking at automation, full automation, um, as well as semi-automation today. Um, the thing with full automation is that it doesn't fit everything. You know, it's, 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 it's one of those things where there's so much that needs to be uh, that needs to be looked at. You take an existing application that may be a 30-year-old application that potentially has different size pallets, has whole overhanging products. Um, that's not necessarily something that can be easily automated. But if you take a brand new building from the ground up, then that automation can be built into that building, um, you know, to a large degree. I mean, you know, the, the lithium products that, that you guys supply, um, you know, the same thing can, can almost be said for those. You know, there's a larger power draw on lithium-ion batteries when they're being charged. Then older buildings we're seeing it doesn't necessarily suit or it's expensive to, you know, to, to make the building um, compliant with that kind of thing. But from a brand new build, and there's a lot of this happening today, you know, we've seen this right the way through the pandemic. Um, you, you know, the fact that e-commerce has, has risen greatly 
Um, people are building new buildings, new warehouses. So it is something that can be considered and factored in at that point. Can I, I just need to stick with Pete for a second, everybody. Um, because, you know, we, we've got JF here with, with, with uh, a, a, from a battery supplier. What percentage of your trucks now would you say are going to be electric compared to the internal combustion models now? Is it? So, I mean, from Crown's perspective, we have um, since, you know, 1945, when, you know, when Crown was established, we primarily been an electric warehousing company. So, we yes, we do manufacture IC trucks, um, but the trend very much right now is all moving away from IC back towards electric. Even people traditionally that would be using IC machines out in a yard are looking at electric. You know, in the same way as obviously motor vehicles, um, you know, JF mentioned about, you know, EV earlier on, um, you know, that's obviously globally is a is becoming a big thing. And certainly from a UK perspective, you know, in, in sort of eight, nine years time, the government are saying you can't sell an IC engine anymore. It has to be, it has to be an EV vehicle. Well, we're seeing the same kind of trend within the, you know, within the forklift industry. Um, we're well positioned for that because it's what we've always done anyway. You know, we've always primarily been um, a manufacturer of electric warehousing equipment. Sure. I mean, Adam, let me bring you in because I know that Marangoni do a tyre which is, you know, sp specified for electric use because of because of safety aspects. Can you talk to talk to us about that a bit? Yeah, I mean, I, was, I think I was going to ask that, too. I was yeah. curious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the. The, the, the Evo tyre that we produced, um, our customers were asking for a, a, a more efficient product working with uh, electric vehicles. So, so the, the Eltor Evo tyre, literally the, the, the main uh, perspective of that product is to be as low rolling resistant as possible. So customers were finding that, you know, that, you know they wanted that battery to charge to last, you know, at least a shift, two shifts, three shifts if they wanted it to last as long as possible and so that's that's why we developed that product and, and why we've been growing that range as well um and then on top of that obviously you've got to have a um the compound can't just be low rolling resistant it's also got to have that inner compound that gives that flexibility um because as we know that a forklift doesn't come with a suspension you've got some springs in the seat for the driver but there isn't a suspension like you would get in a car so the the only um suspension comes from from the tires themselves so so we had to produce a product that has that resilient compound inside the tire that that gives it that feel as close as possible to a pneumatic um which in turn makes the you know the the, the forklift operator um more efficient because they're more comfortable um it's as simple as that so so yeah it's the it's the evo range of a product that was specifically designed for 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 the electric uh, uh forklifts and that ties in with what Pete was saying, that comfort of the driver is, seems to be a major driver now for in terms of customer wants. Absolutely. And, and even as a tyre wears down closer and closer to that safety line, you know, it, it just it becomes more uncomfortable for the driver and, and they'll soon start complaining and wanting the tyres changed. So they're, you know, back on track again. It's it's amazing the difference that it makes to the to the efficiency. And, you know, certainly if you're you know, driving that forklift for any real length of time, you really notice it. So, so yeah, it helps to have that uh, that resilience right from the beginning. I, I want to come on to JF in a minute and ask about other types of electric power for for forklifts. But just while we're talking about tyres, there, um, Pete, I don't, I don't know, I, I don't, I, I don't know if if Crown customers on Crown forklifts are provided with Marangoni tyres or not, or, or 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 which companies you do work with. But what processes go into, what thought processes go into choosing which tyre will go with which forklift? Um, yeah, so there's there's obviously a couple of those. I mean, Adam's covered off, you know, the vast majority of it. Um, you know, it, it has to be very much a combination between rolling resistance, um, the wearability of the tyre. You know, it's great having something that has, you know, that has a, a, a high or a, sorry, a low rolling resistance. Um, but you don't want that wearing out in next to no time. So there's got to be, a, you know, an amount of resilience there. Um, we have, you know, certainly on our ESR machines, we effectively have a traction control system on there. Um, because, again, one of the things that you get with electric vehicles, 
is right from the outset, there's so much talk. Um, you know, you, you hear it on, you know, EVs on the road these days, you know, all the talk is right from the word go. So we have to control that with internal systems so, so that we're not ruining tyres right, right from the outset. You know, so rolling resistance, the wear resistance, the compass of it, they're all factors that go into the chosen tyre that's on it. You know, what's known as the shore resistance of the um, of the tyre, all big factors. OK, um, coming back, JF, then I want to come back to this this issue of electric power, because we know it's we know it's going to be a huge uh, factor. Well, it already is, but it will be further going forward. You talked about lithium, but there are other types of electric power, aren't there? Can you talk a bit about those? Yeah, of course. Um, well, traditionally, uh, lead acid is the, the, the thing that, that is out there in terms of electric. Um, if we're not talking electric, of course, there's diesel, there's a propane, there's a natural gas. Uh, but that, like, uh, like Pete said, there's a trend. Right now, the, the, the latest data that we get from, from shipment from trucks uh, around the world is about uh, 60 percent electric, um, and and the trend is is going up. Um, so, yeah, lead acid, and then there are different types of uh, of lead acid batteries. Traditionally, you would have uh, for very intense applications uh, patterns of of charging uh, that would encompass uh, eight hours of operation, then eight hours of charging eight hours of resting. So if you wanna have a, a 24 hour operation, you would need to have three batteries to, to, to run your operation. Uh, and then there, there has been some uh, innovations in terms of, of lead, uh, opportunity charging, fast charging. So these technologies allow to keep the battery in the truck and uh, charge it just like you would charge your phone. When you have a break, you plug it in, you get a few percentages of, uh, of state of charge up. Um, and then lithium, like I said, as faster charging, uh, that's one of the benefits. And it doesn't uh, fatigue as much as, uh, as lead, so you don't have to respect those strict patterns of, uh, of charging. It doesn't affect the, the life of the product as much. So that's a, that's a big benefit. Um, and then there's, there's other uh types of energy like uh, hydrogen that you that you hear of uh that is also um part of the mix um maybe not as mature as uh, as the the other two but uh showing quite quite good potential well why uh, is that not as mature as lithium because lithium has definitely taken the lead hasn't it yeah well uh producing producing uh, hydrogen uh takes a lot of energy and uh, depending on where you are in the globe, producing that electricity might not be as sustainable as in other places. We're lucky in, in Quebec, we, we have a lot of hydro. So it, it would make sense uh, in a certain way to, to have hydrogen, but it doesn't apply to places in the world where, where electricity is produced with, with coal. So that's one thing. And the, the other thing is uh, the infrastructure required to have the, an, an hydrogen uh, supply in a factory. So for, for small uh, warehouses, uh, there's, at this point in time, there's no return on, on investment in, in having a big uh, infrastructure of hydrogen. So I guess that's the, the reason why it's not taken off as much as, uh, as lithium. Well, that's very comprehensive. Thank you for that. Um, we talked about semi-automated, didn't we? Um, Pete, let me come back to you. Are we going to see any time soon fully, fully automated forklift trucks in warehouses? Because we do know about light, lights out warehouses already, but are we going to see forklifts without drivers? It might rather depends on the application itself. Um, you know, there's, <clears throat> there's a couple of things to consider there. Um, you know, the, the application, the task that's, you know, that's involved in it, not everything lends itself to full automation. Um, the, the flip side of that, I mean, a little bit like lithium, um, there's a cost behind full automation. Um, and obviously that cost is, is significantly higher than a, you know, than a, than a manually controlled, you know, an operator driven 
traditional forklift truck, be it, you know, be it a, a complete manual or a semi-automated machine. Um, so sometimes that, you know, that that cost um, in order to, to go from a manual to a fully operate or fully automated operation doesn't make any commercial sense. Um, you know, certainly our belief is that no, you know, not all forklift trucks are going to end up as fully automated. There will still be manually driven machines. There, there has to be, you know, they're a lot more flexible um, than, a, than a full automation is. But certainly for tasks where, you know, pallet sizes can be, you know, can be kept uniform, the product on it can be kept within the confines of the pallets. Absolutely, there is a place for full automation there without a shadow of a doubt. It's coming. If I, if I may, Paul, we, yeah. we see... Um we see the operation patterns of our customers and uh, some of them are, are like a clock. They, they really have uh, the same state of charge uh, of the battery shift after shift. They do the, the same things because they're really organized. And we have other customers who have a different reality. They, they do some uh, order preparation. So it always depends on what the customer is, is, is asking for. So this is a, a little more chaotic. So having fully automated in, in that type of operation would be more of a challenge. Yeah. Has, has the use of a forklift, is, has the e-commerce, for instance, has it changed how the machines are used? Uh, without a shadow of a doubt, yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things certainly that we've seen Certainly over the last couple of years, you know, pandemic and the, you know, the growth in e-commerce, um, you know, the fact that you've not been able to, um, you know, or you weren't able to go out into the high street and buy a product, you know, people would sit at home and order it online. So, you know, a lot of facilities where those products are coming from have grown, um, you know, their throughput has got bigger, faster, you know, more aggressive. And obviously when that happens with that industry, that has you know, that same thing rolls on to the, you know, the machines that are moving that product. Um, you know, so from our perspective, you know, there's there's been a growth in the, in the you know, in the demand for trucks, um, which goes right the way through our industry because it's, you know, obviously trucks like any product, they, you know, they need maintenance. So, you know, it's not just a, a demand on the trucks themselves, it's a demand on the service providers as well that are maintaining those equipment. Sure. I mean, uh, Louise, let me bring you back in now, if I may. Um, we've seen that there's a lot of there's a lot of pressures and a lot of decisions that need to be made by, you know, logistics managers and, and by operators of, of forklift trucks, because there's there are so many aspects they need to consider. So I just wonder whether they will uh, when safety is considered as well by the manufacturers, as we've seen from what Pete's told us. And, and, and from the considerations that the tire manufacturers put in towards safety, for instance, you know, how much of a challenge is it for you to say to customers, you need these grips, they, they, you know, to get them front of mind in, so that they consider them as a serious need in their warehouse? Well, when you look at the last couple of years and the increase in e-commerce um, and the KPIs that the drivers are under, like they're under a lot more pressure to produce and their demands are higher. Is that having to work so, hard, do you mean? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, the, the demand on them, you know, and when you think of a, a, a driver's daily um, expectations and in a warehouse, the situation, like some warehouses, like um, the guys were saying, you're moving the same thing on the same pallet every day. And a lot of other warehouses aren't like that. It's different. The stock can be on one end of it and oh, one day and another end the other day. So that um, changing environment for the drivers when they're under pressure, um, you know, safety becomes a really big issue. And not only just the safety, but it's also the, the damaged product at the end. And that comes down to the managers. They, they start getting under pressure for reducing that cost, um, that overhead a lot of companies allow for it, but they keep saying, well, we've got to reduce that cost. So when your product's being protected and it's in a safer environment, it's better for everyone. And it is a, it's a high pressure environment for, for people that are working in the warehouse under that pressure. Sure, absolutely. In terms of, um, you know, affordability, and again, coming back to you, Pete, has, has, has forklift affordability got easier or harder? We say this against the background of where we know there are supply chains are restricted. We know that raw material costs are going up. 
we've heard we've heard from JF about you know the high cost of lithium, for instance. So, how do you keep forklifts affordable? New models. It's a good question. Very good question. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, costs are are obviously on the increase. You know, whether it's energy costs or you know general operational costs and. You know, one of the things from a crown perspective over the years that we've done, you know, our machines are are always built to last. You know, we're we're an American-based company, um, and where potentially um, other manufacturers may use things like plastic covers, um, all of our what we term as touch points on our truck. So anywhere the truck is likely to come into contact with anything, you know, be it the load that's on the front or you know somebody clipping a barrier as they're going around the corner, every one of those touch points um, is, a, is, a, is made of steel. So being a steel cover, a steel chassis. Um, there's you know, a good example of that. I mean, there's one particular component on our machines, the, the safety arms that we use on any, um, any truck that has a foldable, foldable platform on, so an operator foldable platform. We, we offer a lifetime warranty on those, um, on those side arms. Um, and that's based on our, you know, the, the build design, the robustness of, of what we're building. So, I mean, that's one way in which we kind of combat those costs. You know, we build a truck and we build it to last. You know, if people see that they're a, you know, they're a robust machine, potentially it might mean that at the, you know, the end of a the contract, they can, you know, they can roll it on for a little further because it's capable of doing so. Um, there's, you know, going back to the semi-automation thing on the VNA machines, that again is something that helps with costs. You know, if we can increase their productivity, may, may only need to be 5%, 10%. But obviously, there is a value placed on that increase in productivity. You know, it takes less labor to do the same work. Um, likewise, we have, you know, we have semi-automation on some of our low-level order pickers as well that allows operators to remotely control the truck. So it keeps the operator in their, their optimum picking area. Um, which again means that their productivity goes up, they can perform their task quicker, but still safer than they would normally do. And obviously all of those things are ways in which we can, we can promote that lowering of cost. You know, it all comes into the total cost of ownership of the, uh, you know, the product over its lifetime. So what's, let me ask all of you, it, it seems like an obvious question, but what's the, what's the most important question that a, customer should ask when they're looking to perhaps upgrade their forklift fleet let me come to you first adam because as someone who, know, who knows about this industry for a long time what's the question what's the mistake you most often see made perhaps that might be another way of putting it the biggest mistake i suppose that i see that actually i've learned recently is that that a customer will that what they really need is a three-ton machine but they buy a two and a half ton Put it, put it as simply as that, you know, that I see customers just thinking, okay, let's keep the costs, you know, as, as low as possible. We, we, we should get away with a two and a half ton. And they're not thinking about the fact that that three ton machine, the components, all the components on that machine, um, they are, they are built, they are, they're built for that, that three ton type machine. And they are, you know, so if you're pushing the limits of a two and a half ton, the three ton is really going to just last so much longer and just give you so much more, you know productivity in, in in my opinion and then and then of course from a tire perspective you're getting a bigger tire and a better footprint and a, and, and the weight you know across a, a wider pattern and and so your, your tire is going to last longer as well so that, that i think you know that 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 cost of ownership then kicks into play with 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 regards to that and i think if you're going for that 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 slightly upgraded type product um and also with a forklift tire you know you, you want to you want to change your tires twice, uh, three times a year, four times a year, or just once a year and putting, putting on a more premium product. And it's so, so difficult sometimes to, to explain that to a, a customer and really sort of show them that. Um, I was thinking that we, with Louise's product actually, and you know, surely it's quite simple for a, a, an operations director of a, of a warehouse to look at how, many, how much of their products being damaged and, and add up that amount, the, the cost of, of what's being thrown away and think, okay, well, well, let's invest in her product, you know, her products that are going to reduce that right down to possibly nothing. It, it, it seems, it seems very straightforward to me. <laughs> great, great stuff, Adam. Um, Louise, you, you, you know, you meet a lot of, a lot of people with forklifts. And, and so what, what do you think is the, uh, what do you think is the biggest mistake they, they make in buying decisions? 
I have to say the same as Adam, how many times you've got on it, kitted out a forklift and made it safe. And, you know, three months later, though, oh, we had to upgrade because the one that we purchased that we thought was going to be right was incorrect. So it's picking the wrong size, you know, for the wrong application because it can't, you know, when it comes down to it, most, most decisions are made by a budget instead of looking at the longevity of your machine. So, yeah, definitely. Great advice. JF, what would you add to that? Well, you, you all said it. Uh, the, I think the long, uh, the long run is important. So the total cost of ownership is something that people should definitely look at, not, not just the, the price at the beginning. And then again, on the long run, uh, service is really important for, for products like, uh, like Pete's or I'm sure uh, Adams and, and Louis too. Uh, having someone who knows uh, about the, their product and what it's, it's doing for your business is really important. Um, like in, in our case, our customers do fruits and vegetables. Uh, they do uh, motors. They're not experts in batteries. So uh, we, we take that part. We remove the risk from them because, mm -hmm. well, if you want to manage something that you, you're not uh, uh, expert with, there's, there's a risk. And all, all those customers want to evacuate the risk as, as much as possible. So, yeah, I, I guess that's the, the recommendation that I would have. Yeah, yeah there's three great answers. Is there anything to add to those, Pete, or have, 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 all, the, have all the mistakes been summed up there? Uh, I thought if I could flip that on its head, rather than you know, the, the mistakes that people make, I think the one thing that is overall important is not just to look at I need a truck to move that from A to B, you know, give me a price and there you go. It's the whole package, you know, it's it's everything from, you know, the supply of any additional safety equipment, the supply of the energy product, the tires that are on the machine, all the way down to the product itself and how that product is going to be serviced throughout its lifetime. You're not just these days, certainly in the UK and Europe, especially where um, the vast majority of products are not bought outright these days. You know, they're put on some kind of a, a contract hire or a finance lease mm. agreement, which basically means that at the end of that, at the end of that term, they're then going to give that product back and bring the new product in. Um, and certainly from Crown's perspective, one of the things that we're looking at is not just that first lifetime. We're looking at the second lifetime. You know, at the end of that period, be it five years, seven years, whatever it is, um, what, what's going to happen then? Um, you know, we pride ourselves on being able to being able to retain those customers long term so at the end of the five-year period you know they're so so impressed and so integrated with you know with the crown philosophy the crown equipment you know and, and how we support our customers with the data that we get from the likes of you know inflink our fleet management system that they don't want to go anywhere else you know they don't want to look at anything else it, it's about you know it's about the whole package the whole um you know the the, the whole application the system and, you know, and the solution that we provide for them. Okay, fantastic. Well, look, I think we're pretty much out of time. So what I'll do is I'll give you 10, 15 seconds each. Why should, why should customers pick you over your competitors? So let's just do a quick fire round on that, starting with you, Adam. Oh, just for the cost of ownership of a, of a quality product and the backup and the support that comes with that really is, is what I'd like to say. Thanks, Adam. Brilliant. Louise? Well, safety is basically priceless. You don't really want to risk it. So just get the products on your, on your forks is basically get a grip, as we say. We're getting these fantastic little concise pictures. This is fantastic. <laughs> JF, what about you? You're muted. Sorry. Yeah. So just, just after the, the great pitch from Louise, that was pretty bad, eh? <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I guess Yugo Work is is um, the the all in one solution for energy. We're energy experts. So if if you're not expert in energy, and I'm, I mean, all of our customers are not, then this is the the place to start. We we won't push a solution that's not uh, doing the right thing for you. So um, yeah, fantastic. And quick last word, Pete. Yeah. So you know. Rugged design, you know, longevity of the equipment, um, the backup, the service that we provide. And, you know, as I said right at the beginning, you know, it's not just about the, the equipment. It's all, about, it's all about the data as well. 
you know, the support that we can provide where that data is concerned as well. Fantastic. Well, that was really good. A, a true global panel as well from all corners of the world. So it was great to use technology and get you all here today at this time. I'm very grateful for your time. Just to say to our, to our audience, please do send questions to any of our panelists and they'll be delighted to answer those for you. Um, meanwhile, good luck to everyone and I look forward to seeing you all soon and thank you for watching us.